show us your glory, Lord. This is the cry of our hearts this morning. Amen. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord.
as we come back to our seats, let's read a word of the, of the Lord. You remain seated, please. Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us, us, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this church, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, Thank not by Lord. works, Amen. so that no one can boast, Hallelujah. for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do.
creation to the cross. Bear from the cross into eternity. Your grace finds me. Let your grace finds me. There in the darkest night. There in the darkest night of the soul.
Jesus, Jesus, your name is power. Bread and living water, such a marvelous name. before you, knowing that we are serving a God who is alive, knowing that we are serving a God who knows how to things, who take care of us. And Father, we just give to you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that belongs to you. I pray that you would continue to move in our hearts. God, even as we are going to listen to your word this morning, you speak to us clearly, O oh God, through your servant. And I pray that we will have a heart, a receptive heart. Oh, Jesus, to just lift you. Because you indeed is a great and mighty God that we serve. Oh, we bless your name. We bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Can we just give an applause of praise and thanksgiving to Him who is seated on the throne? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come before you today with a desire to know you more and to grow more in the spirit and in truth, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that we will give you our undivided attention that the word I will speak this morning, God, will also speak to the hearts of everyone here gathered today. That we can identify with your words, Lord, and receive grace and mercy. And be revived, be refreshed. And Lord, give us a peace and assurance, O oh God, that in your house, you will meet all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That in your house, O oh God, you can experience healing. In your house, O oh God, we can experience deliverance, O oh God. In your house, O oh God, we can experience comfort and peace and love and fellowship with one another, the Lord. So, Father God, thank you that as we bless your name, you're blessing us in return, O oh God. 
Thank you so much, O oh God, for this wonderful group of people gathered. Oh, Lord, now come to the point of listening the message from your heart. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm excited to speak this morning with the message God <clears throat> placed in my heart these few days or these past days. He led me to the book of Jonah. So turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. And we will consider verse 1, 2, and 3 this morning. And of course, some other verses in reference to support the message concerning the confused Jonah. The confused Jonah. Is Jonah confused here this morning? <laughs> I hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> but we will talk about the confused Jonah this morning. Amen. <laughs> and let me, let's read from Jonah chapter 1. I didn't realize that Jonah, do you know, do you, know, do you have a book in the Bible? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, the book of Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 down to verse 3. It says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. But he's not the son of Amittai, he's son of Ace. <laughs> so the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the, oh, I was about to say, about, after praying. It's rather, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, picking up from last Sunday's message about from confusion to confidence, we will consider the confused John this morning. Unlike David and Habakkuk, the two Old Testament characters we were talking about last Sunday, who were also confused and could not comprehend the ways of God, but were truthful about it and the pain they felt, talked to God. Hence, they were helped and experienced deliverance from confusion to confidence. But Jonah, instead of being truthful, about the confusion and how he felt concerning God's compassion over Nineveh, fled and ran away from God's call. The opposite responds to David and Habakkuk. Now, if you still remember what I said last Sunday, I mentioned that there are four ways to cope with confusion. Flee it, fight it, forget it, and face it. Whenever we are faced with confusion, or for that matter, any difficult situation that confronts us, we will usually take one of four measures. Either you will flee from it, fight it, forget it, or face it. Now, I said last Sunday, the first three ends in failure. Only the fourth will get us anywhere. David and Habakkuk chose to face it. They experienced the pain of their confusion and talked to God about it and got help. But Jonah chose to flee from it and went through unnecessary experience or events that could have been avoided and other people could have been spared from trouble had he obeyed God right away. Amen. Now in chapter 1, verse 1, we read that Jonah was introduced as the son of Amittai. Now, the word Amittai, or the name Amittai, means truth or truth-telling. And Jonah means dove, the symbol of peace. Now, he was a prophet to the north east, uh, northern kingdom of Israel. Now, I observe that the combination of the father and son's name is no accident, right? Truth brings peace. Once you know the truth, once you experience truth, you will also experience peace in your life. And Jonah was called by God to tell the truth, to tell the message of truth that brings peace to Nineveh if they repent. 
Now, if you will study, the call of Jonah is to go to Nineveh and to preach against it. God told him to announce a judgment against the city because of how wicked its people are. Now, ancient historians say that Nineveh was the largest city in the world at the time. It was the large, important capital of a dominant empire, the Assyrian, and surely an intimidating place to go. Now, the city was about 500 miles northeast of Galilee. Not that far, 500 miles east or northeast of Galilee. Now, from the book of Nahum, we discovered that Nineveh was also known as the city of blood. A city of blood because she had cruelly massacred large numbers of conquered peoples. They are so wicked that God must intervene and put a stop the wickedness by destroying them after 40 days if they will not repent. Uh, you will notice when I was reading this, when Nineveh actually came now to Nineveh, he said, for after 40 days, if you will not repent, God will destroy Nineveh. Now, the word 40 days there stood out in my mind because, wow, I said, wow, God, you're so gracious. There was a 40 days grace period. That's how good our God is, cheers. Amen. You know, God delays his judgment to give more room and space and time for people to repent from their sins. That is the grace extended of God to us because it is not the will of God that any man should perish but should come to repentance. Amen. Hallelujah. So right now, God is delaying his judgment to give more people grace, period, to repent. We know that after Jonah preached repentance, the whole city from the greatest to the least repented and was spared from destruction and that was a revival. Amen. From the king, from the monarch, the highest authority, down to the least, even the animals were commanded to fast and repent. And the Lord relented his judgment over Nineveh. Now, in my observation, have you observed something here? But in my personal observation, I thought how easy for them to repent. Just one stranger, Jonah, with one preaching, with a short message, the whole city repented. Today, 3,000 messages, one soul saved. I'm just exaggerating, but I got, you, you know, you were seeing the point that it's so difficult to share the gospel nowadays, right? I thought how easy for them to repent. I wish that it were as easy for people today to repent and accept Jesus as their Savior. No resistance. But I discovered that based from history, something happened in Nineveh that softens the heart for the gospel, that prepared them for Jonah's message. Prior to Jonah's coming to Nineveh, something happened in their history. Something happened in Nineveh that prepared their hearts, that softened their hearts for the gospel that Jonah brought. Now, according to history, Nineveh's repentance in response to Jonah's preaching most likely occurred during the reign of one or one of two Assyrian monarchs. One is Adad-Nirari III in 810-783 BC, whose reign was marked by a swing toward monotheism, a belief in one God. Now, this monarch became a seeker. He wanted to believe there is only one God. Monotheism, a belief in one God. He was a seeker and he wanted to transform the whole city to just worship one God. And you know what? I believe that there are people around us who, who right now are thinking about God, considering religion, so to speak, or more clearly, they are seeking for God. Amen. Right now, in this city, outside the walls of our church, there are people right now who are seriously seeking God. They're considering religion 
And you know what? You might be the Jonah that God will send to help them find God. Amen. You might be the Jonah of this generation to tell them the reality of God. Now, the second monarch is assured on the third in 733 to 755 BC, whose reign experienced two major plagues. 765 to 759 BC, and an eclipse of the sun in 763 BC, and both of which may have been interpreted as a sign of divine judgment and thus prepared Assyria's capital for Jonah's prophetic message. And I also believe that there are people nowadays now who are going through some kind of tragedy or hardship that is softening and is preparing them to receive the message of hope. They are in their moments of need. And they're looking to God now as an answer. And this is an opportunity to share the message of hope and salvation. Amen. Amen. That's why church, let us go and make disciples. People are seeking the Lord. Your friends maybe are seeking the Lord. Maybe your friends are going through a hardship in life. At the birth of divorce or bankruptcy or, or health issues or whatever issues in life are going through challenges. And they need the Jonas of this generation to tell them the message of hope and salvation. Amen. Young people, I've heard. The two young people were rushed to the hospitals because of overdose of marijuana. You see the effect now of this legalization of marijuana in this country. Two already were rushed to the hospital because of overdose. Young people, 15 years old, 16 years old. There's a need, young people, to go tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. But before this, Jonah fled from God. Jonah fled from God. Verse 3 says, Jonah chapter 1 verse 3 says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and hid it for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish. What? To flee from the Lord. To flee from the Lord. He opted to flee from the Lord. He decided to run away from the Lord. Now to give you an idea how Jonah fled, imagine a Jewish man in New York during World War II hearing God say, I'm going to bring Terrible judgment on Germany. I want you to go to Berlin and tell Nazi Germany to repent. Instead of doing it, the man heads for San Francisco and then hops on a boat to Hong Kong. So can you imagine the road? Now if you look at the map, Israel is here and Tarsh is here in modern day Spain. Okay, and it will only take four, four hours flight by plane, okay, right, by flight, by plane, no, from, from Israel down to Spain. Because during, this, during the time of Jonah, they thought that Tarshish is the farthest place almost to the end of the earth. So in other words, Jonah, when he, Jonah decided to flee from God, he wanted to run away as far as he could. Isn't that the attitude of those who are running from God? They will run away from God as far as they could. Yeah. Jonah wanted to run away from God as far as he could. It was believed during these this days that Tarshish was the farthest place and almost at the end of the earth. It was opposite to the direction God wanted him to do. Jonah could have avoided to be swallowed alive by the fish 
if he obeyed God right away. Imagine inside the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Can you imagine? Total darkness. The smell. The seaweeds. The other dead fish inside the belly of the whale. And you know what? It was God's power that preserved him not to be dissolved by the acid in the stomach or in the belly of the fish. Three days. Or maybe just too hard for him to be digested. Because those who run away from God are really hard. hard headed Stoned heart. But he wasn't dissolved. He wasn't digested for three days and three nights. Of course, I will not go into details about what took place in the escapade of Jonah. But as I studied deeper, the book of Jonah, a short book with only four short chapters, I found out some reasons why he fled from God's call. Reasons that could also be the reasons why many Christians nowadays are reluctant to witness for Christ. I discovered it was not fear. He wasn't afraid. I think, you know, in my observation, Jonah was not afraid that he will be ineffective as a witness. He was afraid that he is effective to witness. Which you will soon uh, discover that. But first reason that I discover is that in my observation, Jonah was confused. Jonah was confused. He was confused because he could not understand how could God be so compassionate and merciful to a nation like Nineveh, the city of blood. Isn't it confusing? He's supposed to die. They're supposed to be punished. They're supposed to be destroyed, removed from the map. But yet God showed compassion and mercy to Nineveh. He thought Nineveh deserved to be punished instead of showing mercy. He knew that God would forgive them if they repent, and he doesn't like it. Amen? He doesn't like it. Let's read chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Let's go jump to chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. About Jonah's reaction after Nineveh repented and God relented from his judgment. You know what the Bible says? Salvation of one soul... Thousands of angels are rejoicing in heaven. But here, more than 120 civilians in Nineveh got saved, but Jonah got mad. <laughs> he was mad. Let's read it in chapter 4, 1, 2, 3 about Jonah's reaction after Nineveh. said, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, the salvation, the forgiveness, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Woo! I hope nobody could identify with Jonah this morning. Not one of us can identify with this attitude of Jonah. Not as on Sean, okay? Jonah, the son of Amittai here. <laughs> now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. He knew the nature of God is to show love and forgiveness, but not to Nineveh. He'd rather die than to think about it. He'd rather die than thinking about this. Now, his confusion did not only lead him to flee from God's call, but also made him so confused to the point of really being angry. Church, I want you to know we should not miss the intensity of Jonah's anger here because the language in the original Hebrew is very strong. And I want you to and be assured of this. Beneath confusion, there is an element of anger. It may not be recognized, but it is there nevertheless. I want to say it again. Beneath confusion, there is an element of anger. It may not be recognized, but it is there nevertheless. And Jonah 
is a typical example of this. Jonah was not only confused because he cannot comprehend why God would spare Nineveh. And beneath the confusion, he was angry. He was so mad. He was fuming mad because Nineveh repented and God relented from his judgment. But I guess also, obviously, second reason, obviously, Jonah was not interested for the salvation of Nineveh. He was not interested for the salvation of Nineveh. Jonathan Swift wrote a, some verse that expresses Jonah's frame of mind. I want to read you this one verse. They say, we are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. Right? We are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. I think that's your frame of mind. But we have to understand that God's interest for souls is found in Jesus Christ. Hello, church. If you will study the life and teaching of Jesus Christ, you will see the interest of God for a single soul. He came and died for the salvation of our souls. He came to seek and save those who are lost. He left the 99 and went seeking for one lost soul. That's how God so interested with soul. What shall profit a man if he gains the whole world and lost his soul? And jump into chapter 4. God rebuked Jonah for his lack of interest for the people of Nineveh. Jonah chapter 4 tells us that after Jonah delivered the message, he went out of the city, went to a high place where he had a vantage point to see the city. He was expecting that after 40 days, what he said would come to pass. But after 40 days, nothing happened to Nineveh. As he foretold, the city was not destroyed by earthquake or by fire. And he was so angry that God spared the city. Imagine that. He spoke, repent. If not, in 40 days, New York City will be destroyed by fire. And the whole city, from the, the, the king down to the least, even including the animals in between, repented and called for a fast. And Jonah walked away from the city, went to the east side, and went to the highest hill, and looked and sat there and waited for 40 days to see the fire or the earthquake coming to destroy it. He didn't believe the message himself. But after 40 days, nothing happened to Nineveh. Instead, he was hearing revival in the city. Amen. And God spoke to him in verse 11. And, and, and God said to Jonah, And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? Wow. And also many animals. Wouldn't I be concerned for this? No, the background... While the hill, watching over the city of Nineveh, and when the sun came, the Lord overnight allowed a vine to grow up quickly, a fast-growing vine, to give him shade by the day. And overnight, the vine died. And Jonah was so angry why the vine died. And God said, Jonah, do you have the right to be angry? Yes, I have all the right to be angry. The vine that is giving me comfort is dead. And God said, well, Jonah, you have no right. Why are we so concerned about this vine? You don't do anything. You didn't let it grow. You didn't tend to it. It's all me. Why well, you're so concerned? Would I not be so concerned about 120 of all my creation that I love? And if you will notice, if you'll end the story, there was no response from Jonah. What God is saying to us 
that we should also be concerned with what concerns him. Amen. As his disciples, we should be interested with what interests God. We cannot be his disciples and be unsympathetic to the lost and dying people around us. Another reason I think why Jonah was reluctant and fled from God is because he think he was given a difficult job to do. A difficult job to do. Nahum chapter 3 verse 1 to 4 gives us a good idea. We'll not read that. We'll, we'll give us a, a good idea of how wicked the people of Nineveh were. If you will read back home, when you, if you read it when you got home, you will see it's recorded there that there's so many dead people in the city that people stumbled on it. That's why it's called the city blood. Jonah had every reason to expect that at the very least, at the very best, he would be mocked and treated as a fool. He might be attacked and killed it if he did what he, the Lord told him to do. It was a difficult, Lord, Nineveh, my gosh. Now, the story of Jonah has a lot of message address to the Israelites, the chosen people of God, and even for us today. First, Jonah's reluctant attitude to obey, God's, to obey God demonstrates Israel's failure to be the light to the nations. Israel was a chosen nation of God to bring other nations around her to know him. But Israel failed. Let us not fail to serve as the light that gives people hope. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. God chose Israel to be the light to the nations, to be a blessing to the nations. But they failed. And so God used Jonah to demonstrate the failure of Israel as a witness. Jonah was the only prophet of God in the Old Testament that was sent to a hidden nation. The rest were all sent to the people of God, to Israel, to Judah. But Jonah was to the hidden nation. He was sent to Nineveh, not solely for her good, but also to shame Israel. But the fact of a hidden city repenting at the first preaching of a single stranger, Jonah, were us, God's people will not repent, though preached to by their many national prophets late and early. Can you imagine that? The repentance of Nineveh is a slap to their face. One preaching by a stranger brought them to their knees to repent. But Israel, with so many national prophets, late and early, stubborn, rebellious. God sent Jonah to preach repentance to demonstrate his compassion and mercy and to show that with God, no worse sinners could not receive his forgiveness if only they will repent. Jonah has, Jonah has forgotten that God's ultimate purpose for Israel was to be a blessing to the Gentiles and help bring them to a knowledge of God. And let's not forget that we too were saved for a purpose. Amen, church. We too are saved for a purpose. Your purpose is higher than just going to church every Sunday. Church, I want you to know that. Amen. I want you to know that your purpose is higher than just giving, giving tithes or love offering or helping service or the food distribution or whatever. It's higher than that. Amen. It's higher than that. I want you to have a change of mindset, a paradigm shift right now, that your purpose is higher than that. We are here as the light of the world. We exist, we're saved to share salvation as well. You cannot share salvation if you yourself is not saved. Jonah's story is relevant in our days. Jesus called this generation as an evil and wicked generation. Amen. I think we surpassed the wickedness of Nineveh. Our generation has surpassed the wickedness of Nineveh. 
The wickedness of this generation has come to a point that his judgment is about to take place. But we are given a grace period. And when this grace period, hallelujah, God has called us to tell someone about his message of hope and love and repentance. We are in this 40 days grace period, church. Where God is calling us to rise up from your comfort zone and go and be the Jonah of this generation. Amen. Now Christ has called the church to fulfill an even greater missionary task that of Jonah. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. But yet, statistics indicates that 95%, 95% of all Christians have never led another person to Christ. In responding to this call, let us not be like Jonah, but learn from his story and answer God's call with a sense of urgency. Amen? Amen? The great spirit might be soon over. Or as Jesus said in John chapter 9, verse 4 from the Living Bible Translation, I want to read it to you. It says there, all of us must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent me. For there is little time left before the night falls and all works comes to an end. Hallelujah. We must carry out Come on, we must carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent me. For there is little time left before the night falls and all work comes to an end. Yes. There's no night duty there. There's no graveyard schedule here. Meaning when the Lord comes back, that's it. If like Jonah, you, res you respond to God's call in reluctance because you were confused. And beneath your confusion is your anger. You think, how can I tell someone about God when I myself is going through some situation in life that confuses me? Perhaps you think I'm faithful to God, reading His Word regularly, giving my tithes and always praying. But why is it my life is going through a lot of difficulties? Why is this? Why is my life's experience different from what the pastor told me? Or what the Bible says? Why? I cannot understand. I am praying and I know and I believe I'm praying according to the will of God. But how come there seems to be no answer even right now? I pray this for years. So how come? And we get confused. We get discouraged. And how can I share the gospel of God when I myself is confused? How can I share? They see my hardship. People know my hard life. How can I convince them that God is loving and merciful? Church, I want to encourage this morning. Don't let Satan use your confusion to stop you from being a witness for Christ. God understands your confusion and anger and he loves you nevertheless. And as you, pers and as you patiently wait, you will have the answer. But know this. Know this, that your effectiveness to witness for Christ is not based upon your comfort in life or status in life, but based upon your obedience to Christ. What I'm saying here is, it is not your hardship and suffering that will stand out in the observation of the people around you. But it is your positive attitude and godly response toward your, toward your hardship that makes your witness effective because in it, people around you will see the reality of God's grace in your life. Amen? Or maybe like Jonah, Christians today have no interest in winning souls for Christ. They're not interested because they think that they are not qualified or they are not gifted or as talented. But you know what? These are the people that God is looking for. Why? 
Because God is not looking for ability as much as He's looking for availability. There are others who are talented, but nowhere to be found in the ministry. There are those who are gifted, but it's hard to request them to do this, to do, do that. There are those who are, oh, I'm not as talented, but yes, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing, oh God. Because God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the cold. Amen. Amen, church. Hallelujah. As Greg Lawrence said in his book, tell someone, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the cold. Christians are not interested because they think it is difficult, right? Maybe we find it difficult to witness for Christ because it is going against our personality. I had a struggle. It's difficult sometimes to speak because it's against my personality. Christian says, I am shy. I'm camera shy. I'm not people person. I'm not comfortable talking to strangers. I don't know how. Leave that to the experts. Leave that to the soul winners in the chairs and there's only one. But we have to remember that if it is, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You have a wrong focus. You focus on your limitations, and yes, we are limited in many ways. And let's focus on Him who will enable us. The power of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will enable us. All we need to do is to trust and obey the Lord. The promise in the Great Commission that Jesus gave to His disciples before He went back to heaven is, I will be with you to the end of the age. To those who go, I will go with Him. Woo! And if God is for us, who can be against us? And the promise of God said, I will put words in your mouth. Jesus knew that it's going to be difficult because he himself experienced the difficulties. That's why he told them to wait for the promise of the Father to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the 120 disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. And after that, with the power of the Holy Spirit, went all over the place preaching repentance to all people. But prior to this experience, they were hiding in their homes, huddling together in fear and doubt and confusion, thinking, boy, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The master is now dead. There's nothing we can do about this. Let us hide because we'll be next in life. But yet, after they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, right away, they stormed the streets, and Peter preached, and 3,000 souls were saved that day. In the power of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. And the book of Acts recorded their difficulties and persecution, yet it did not stop them from fulfilling the Great Commission. The way to develop self-confidence to overcome difficulties to witness for Christ is to know some basic scriptures that show the way in which people can be saved. Just a basic thing. Your testimony plus this verse here, shirts, plus the power of the Holy Spirit, who knows that person might be seeking the Lord. Who knows that person might be having difficulties in life and he needed hope and salvation. And our way to overcome any hindrances to witness for Christ is to change our mindset. Sometimes it is just a wrong mindset that hinders us to obey the call of Christ. Many Christians think that it is the work of the clergy or the gifted few. But this call to go and make disciples is a call for every Christian. We have to remember this, not to share your faith, not to tell others about Jesus can be an actual sin. Hello? Not sharing the good stuff in your life. The faith you have, the salvation you have, the reality of God is actually a sin. It's not just 
immorality, lying, bad words, or bad movies, or bad internet, what, no. By not doing what is good is actual sin. James chapter 4 verse 7 to convince you, it says here, James chapter 4 verse 7 says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Did you read that? Oh no, not yet. Right? If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. As the Bible said, church, that were ordained to do good works. That was part of the scripture reading today. We were ordained to do good works. That's not yet James 4, 7. Is that it? Oh, got, got one. It's not, I, I just read it. Submit themselves, yourself then to God. Resist the devil. And he will, yes, that's not it. If anyone then knows the, God, the, good, the good they ought to do and, chose and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Yes, church, it might be difficult, but the will of God will not take you where God's grace cannot protect you. 4.17, James 4.17. You missed one, I missed one number, one. Just one makes a difference, huh? One mistake makes you... <laughs> you see? But I want you to know, yeah, we, it's difficult to witness. Yes, it's difficult to witness. It's difficult to witness, especially against your personality. But the will of God will not take you where God's grace cannot protect you. You have the Spirit of God in you, empowering you to go and make disciples. Therefore, church, as I close, don't let your confusion or lack of interest, or difficulty hinders you to be the Jonas of our generation. We are the messengers of truth and peace. Remember that Jesus saves, but their knowledge of salvation depends upon us. Do you get me? Jesus saves, but their knowledge of salvation depends upon you. Romans 10 verse 14 tells us. Let's read this. I don't want you to miss this point. Romans 10 verse 14 from the New Living Translation say, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? Doesn't make sense. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Next verse, verse 15. I just, okay, that's it. Oh, no, no, go to verse 15. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Look at your feet. Hallelujah. <laughs> are they ginger looking like feet? But the Bible says it doesn't matter the shape of your feet, hallelujah, in the sight of God, hallelujah, it says, uh, oh, how beautiful are the feet of messengers that bring good news. Amen, church. Therefore, let us not flee from our call, but face the challenge and experience what God said in Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 11.30 that says, Godly men are growing a tree that bears life-giving fruit, and all who win souls are wise. Amen? And all who win souls are wise. God, this morning, help us not to be reluctant like Jonah, like confused Jonah. He fled from God. He didn't face a challenge to go to Nineveh to preach gospel for the first, during the first call. But he had to go through the bell of the whale, the bell of the big fish, for him to realize that he cannot run away from God. He cannot flee from his call. 
that there's always a consequence when you flee from the call of God. God, I pray, spare us from those experiences. But right now, God, from these challenges every Sunday, oh Lord, this series of Sundays now, God, may create in us, Lord, a passion for souls, to witness for Christ. We are the Jonas of this generation. But don't give, we will not follow, we will not copy the attitude of Jonah. But the message of Jonah, the reason why God called Jonah, the wickedness of this generation has come to your face already, God. And you're about to bring judgment, but yet we're given the 40 days grace period. We're in, in this grace period, you're calling your people to be the Jonah of this generation, to warn them. And I know God right now, right now, today, outside the walls of this church, or even here among us, oh God, people are seeking God. There are people who are seeking God. There are people who are thinking about God. People are thinking about religion now. And they wanted to know you. God, send your people out. Send your people out, O oh God, to tell them the truth. And right now, God, there are people who are going through hardship in life, tragedies, questions, confusions, and so forth and so on, O oh God, financially, fa family-wise, and every angle or area of life you're going through. And God, they're looking for hope. They're looking for an answer. Let the Jonas of this generation rise and tell them, hallelujah, the truth and peace that only God can give. Hallelujah, God. Lord, the truth of the matter is, no matter what our reasons are, we cannot flee from you. We cannot run from your call, O oh God. And we don't want to find ourselves inside the belly of the big fish, O oh God. Yes, we have confusion because of our situation too as a Christian. Yes, maybe we don't have interest in Windsor because we lack confidence in ourselves. We have low self-esteem and whatever it is, personality reasons or God. Or we find it difficult, O oh Father Lord. But God, it is not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you came. You were sent to empower us to have that boldness, to have that courage to speak for Jesus. Father God, forgive us. Times to become reluctant. Because of these issues, confusion, lack of interest, and I think it's difficult. God, help us to focus instead to the one who is calling us, the one who will empower us, the one who will shield us, the one who is our strength, the one who is our wisdom, our master, the Lord of the harvest. In the name of Jesus. And so God, from 2018 and beyond, help us, Lord, to be a different church. Hallelujah, Father God. Speak silently to the hearts of your people now. Speak to the hearts of God. Reveal in our hearts that maybe our friends outside the wall of this church is hurting. They're looking for an answer. They're seeking God. We found you already, God. We already found you. We already experienced your peace and hope, O oh Lord. And God, it's too good not to be shared. Help us to be sensitive, Lord, to those around us. 
thank you, God. And Lord, today as we come around the table for the communion, for the Last Supper, help us not to see this only as a ritual or as an ordinance of the church, but we are your followers, that we are partakers of your blood, that we are partakers of your body, and we are partakers of your missions. Help us, Lord, to think beyond the benefits of communion like healing, a time of refreshing, or revival in our hearts, oh God. Help us to think above that, Lord. Say that we, can, we are identifying with who you are. The very reason why you gave your body to be broken is so that we might be made whole. We want to identify with your precious blood poured out so that we might be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. So God, help us not to see only healing, fellowship, or personal time of refreshing our own communion, oh God. But let this challenge us that you gave your body you gave your life, you put out your, your blood, oh God, so that we might be saved, redeemed. And as a redeemed, oh Lord, we can go out to share the Redeemer to those who need to be redeemed. God, the night is coming. The night is coming when no one can work. We don't want our loved ones to be caught by the night and lost the opportunity to see the light. And lost the opportunity to see the light. So Lord, speak to us right now. Father God, perhaps this message is not ministering to the needs of your people individually. Like healing needs motivation, needs encouragement. But Lord, I want this message to go above and beyond those own personal interest to your interest, oh God. Because we believe that as we minister to those who are in need, we too will be ministered in our own needs. So God, I lay this challenge to this church, to all of us, oh God, to go and make disciples. Sanctify the elements that we're about to receive. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And St. Paul, Lord, is giving us an admonition and a warning to examine our hearts first before we partake. If there be any sin we need to confess before the Lord, let us confess it now in your own way, in your own silent way, in your hearts, in your mind. Confess before the Lord and ask forgiveness. Hallelujah. If you need to be reconciled, be reconciled before you partake because otherwise you will be partaking in an unworthy manner. And for that reason, many are weak, many are sickly, and many die because they join the communion in an unworthy manner. If you're here this morning, you have not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to encourage you today, give your life to Christ. Receive him as your Lord and personal Savior. You might be a seeker today. You might be going through tough times in your life today. I want to say to you this morning, Christ is the answer. Jesus is the answer to all your needs. All you need to do right now is say, Lord Jesus, I gave, I gave my life to you. I ask your forgiveness. Forgive me my sins, oh God. I confess all my wrongdoings. Give me hope. Renew my life. Give me a new heart of God, a new spirit 
and make my soul be alive again. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, the blood, the crimson love, rise of lives, demand. Saved my life, yes, the blood, it is my victory. Save your son. As we all together, your disciples, partake of the blood or of the body broken for us. Thank you, God, for the call you gave us today. Let's eat together in Jesus' name. We also celebrate, Lord, to drink the symbol of your blood. We do this in remembrance of you.
Today, let every single person standing holding the cup, O Lord, be reminded that they stand clean before you now because of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, from all wrongdoings. Thank you, God, for the blood. Let's drink it all. Let's confess the songs once again. Once again, the blood of the Lamb. Oh, the blood, crimson blood, rise of lives. continue to just worship the Lord this morning as we are going to collect our tithes and offering. Praise God. And oh what love, no greater love Praise how God could be And in my sin is Bible said in Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your increase. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give the first fruits of our income. As we give, Lord, this morning, Lord, may this money will be used for the expansion of the kingdom. We know, Lord, that you own everything, not just part of it, Lord, but to 100% of our income. Bless, Lord, the works of our hands, our jobs, and our businesses. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray.
So that's March 28th. Uh, that's a Wednesday. And that will be from uh, 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. Our youth ministry has not been join us, right? We have not run away from our calling to reach other young people and uh, share the gospel. And mind you, uh, our own Jonah is doing that calling once again, leading our young adults in the Bible study. So I pray that we will join together and uh, support us in this event. Um, for volunteers, uh, help out as well with, with the snacks that we'll be giving for that time. But more importantly, to please pray for that event. This is our, one of our main evangelistic events where they can invite their friends, their classmates, and if you as parents and uh, if you have fellow parents as well that have teenagers primarily, but we also uh, encourage even the young adults to come because in light of the many events that you see in the news today, right, the, the, the last mass shooting, once again, since time immemorial, people have always needed the gospel of salvation. And now more than ever, they need to hear it. And people may ask, you know, sometimes in the light of these bad, really horrible things that happen, they ask, where is God in all of this? But then we ask ourselves, well, where, when we, where were we when we asked God to go out of our schools, to go out of our classrooms? And that's why all of this is happening. So I pray that um, you please consider us in prayer. Our guest speaker will be Brother uh, Dominic Hapos. For our for that event um, but again our young people will be there leading uh, heeding the call of the great commission to to share the gospel of jesus christ to the young people so uh, in light of that youth and young adults i'd like to meet you after the service so let's uh let's proclaim the message of salvation the today's theme is taken from ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 right we are god's handiwork created in advance to do the good works that god that christ jesus has prepared for us in advance to do. So please be with us for this unchained evangelistic event. And we thank you once again for continuing to support the, the, the youth ministry of this church. Thank you very much. God bless. Amen. Shall we stand up one more time? This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus and sing for all that you've done for me. Let's bow our heads and receive God's blessing, my dear brothers and sisters. And may the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the sweet and intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Yeah. Take